Good morning. Welcome to session three of Appalachian Regional Commission Virtual Summit. I'm John Kerry, alternate for Ohio Governor Mike DeWine. Today's session will feature highways to cyberways. In the first session, we heard about leadership principles in response to COVID. Last week, we learned about how communities are addressing the challenges in recovery work during a pandemic. In this session, you will hear about our more traditional, innovative, and futuristic infrastructure projects. When ARC was created in 1965, its mission was to build infrastructure such as highways, water, and sewer systems. Progress has been made on all fronts, but there's still much work to be done. In Ohio, we're working with the local development districts to map the Appalachian areas of the state that do not have access to clean water. Our efforts have been in partnership with Dean Mark Weinberg of the Voivod School at Ohio University, along with local water districts, Ohio EPA, and local officials. This is an urgent but longstanding public health issue. In addition to the barriers we face with traditional infrastructure projects, broadband has many of the same obstacles. Today, we will focus on broadband access and some of ARC's core missions. The pandemic has made it clear that broadband access is no longer a luxury as we need high-speed internet to learn, to work, and to access healthcare and general quality of life. One of the champions of ARC is Congressman Bill Johnson. He was elected to Congress in 2011 and is retired from the U.S. Air Force, having achieved the rank of Lieutenant Colonel. Congressman Johnson hoped to greet us in his hometown of Marietta, but is still providing the welcome via video. And now we will hear from Congressman Johnson. Summit. Hey, let me tell you, uh, rural broadband is an issue that I am extremely passionate about. Uh, the absence of rural broadband has been highlighted significantly by this pandemic. I don't think there's an elected official from local government, from county commissioners and township trustees, all the way to the President of the United States, that doesn't understand that in the 21st century, in this digital economy that we live in and that we are forced to function in every day, broadband is as important, connection to high-speed internet, as important as plumbing and electricity are to a quality life and to economic opportunity. We've got to solve this problem. I'm doing my part at the federal level. We've got programs like the Rural Digital Opportunity Fund that's working through the FCC. The president has done some things to uh, advance rural broadband expansion. I'm going to stay on that issue because we've got to solve it. It's important for our kids, for distance learning, for teachers and workers, for remote working, and for telehealth. People that can't get out and go to the doctor and get their care right there in the privacy of their home. This is a problem that we've got to solve, and I commend uh, Director Kerry and all of the efforts that you guys are going to to highlight it. Count me in. I want to be a part of the solution. Have a great day. Thank you, uh, Congressman Johnson, and thank you to your staff for participating in today's call. Just a reminder, your microphones are muted and we encourage you to ask questions through the chat box. Governor DeWine and Lieutenant Governor Eustad have made broadband access a priority. Peter Voderberg was appointed by the governor to be chief of Broadband of Ohio. His enthusiasm and passion will come through today as our panel talks about their work. It is my honor to introduce Peter Voderberg. Thank you so much, Director Carey, for that introduction. I am Peter Voderberg, and I am happy to be your moderator and to talk about the importance of infrastructure today. I am currently the Chief of Broadband Ohio, which is a new division of the Development Services Agency that is dedicated to bringing broadband to every Ohio, regardless of where they live. In fact, to talk about the newness of my office, we opened on March 2nd and the first press conference regarding the telehealth pilot project in Monroe County ended with Governor DeWine announcing the first positive COVID test in the state. So as you can imagine, it has been a busy time since the beginning of this job. As Director Carey said, the DeWine Houston administration is dedicated to expanding access to high-speed internet throughout the state, as the digital highway is connecting us more than ever for learning, working, and healthcare. But traditional infrastructure still plays an important role. Businesses and residents alike need safe roads, access to water and electricity, as well as access to broadband. Today, we want to talk about three types of infrastructure. The classic project that brings water roads and electricity to a business park, 
the cutting edge project that brings a new and vital resource to our communities by connecting them to the World Wide Web, and the future project that showcases how we are making our communities ready for cars that drive themselves. Infrastructure will always be a necessary component of successful communities, and we are pleased to have speakers who will talk about how infrastructure projects have impacted the development of their areas. We will start with the classic infrastructure project, and I am pleased to introduce Dwayne Miller, who is the executive director of the Lenawisco Planning District Commission located in Duffield, Virginia. Mr. Miller has been with the Lenawisco for over 25 years, and during that time, Lenawisco has been at the forefront of assisting their service region with infrastructure, broadband, economic, and community development. With that, the floor is yours, Dwayne. Okay, thank you, Peter, very much. And uh, I wanna say uh, thank you to everybody that's, that's joining us here today. Uh, for this this webcast. I know everybody would like to be together somewhere uh, and, and meeting together and having dialogue afterwards, but this is the world we're in right now. Uh, just a quick introduction, and Peter again mentioned we're in Duffield, Virginia, the Linowisco Planning District Commission, but so some of, some of our participants kind of have an idea uh, and can kind of visualize what Linowisco is. We are three counties in one city, 15 incorporated towns, with a population of about 100,000 people and a square mileage of about 1,700 square miles. So just to kind of put in context, I know we probably have people throughout the 13 state uh, ARC region. Uh, so you kind of have some idea of, of, of where we are and, and what we are. Um, as Peter referred to, and I never have been referred to as this, but I'll take it as a compliment in this project as well as classical. Uh, we are a classic uh, infrastructure project, and you're going to hear some great things from some of the other speakers today about infrastructure uh, with broadband and some other things. But we are what, what I like to call the, the, the bread and butter of infrastructure with the project I'm going to discuss today uh, involving water, sewer, and even some transportation infrastructure for a project that we like to uh, call a project intersection. Um, Project Intersection is actually a regional project that we have worked on for two years with all of our member counties uh, to come together to create an industrial development site on a 200 acre site. Um, the site was actually identified by a site study that was prepared uh, by the Virginia Tobacco Commission uh, and it looked at sites throughout our entire region. This site was classified as one of the top sites to, to, to develop. The issue we ran into, and if you all, uh, the first slide there really just kind of summarizes the project. Uh, if someone could go to the uh, next slide real quick. Okay, project intersection, as you can see why we call it project intersection, it is the area that is behind the uh, clover leaf, the three leaf clover leaf that you see there, the 200 acre site. Uh, again, it was identified as the number one site in the study, but the issue we ran into, if you look in the left corner of the site, you'll see what essentially is a mountain or what we affectionately refer to as a high wall in cold country. Um, that high wall has been a predominant feature in our region for, for decades and has really been something we've never been able to address. Um, one thing I, that we always like to say here is, you know, you can create projects around funding opportunities. As opportunities start to come out, you create projects around them where you can create a project um, and then find funding opportunities, which is what we, we chose to do with this project. As I mentioned, we had a study that was put together. Uh, the site was identified, but we didn't have any money. Uh, we were very fortunate that all ARC Power then came into creation. Uh, OSM through the DMME pilot program came into fruition. And really our timing, you know, we had this project lined up and I think this is something for everyone to kind of to, to make a note of. And many of you probably already know this. It is sometimes good to have things planned and ready. So when opportunities do present themselves, you're able to hit the ground running and, uh, and move a project quickly. So we were able to do that. And as of today, we have actually secured in the neighborhood of $12 million uh, in grant funding to do the development of this 200 acre site and remove the high wall. If you look on the right side of, of the screen, you actually can see the uh, preliminary phase one uh, design for the project. 
uh, we've been able to, to, to receive funding from ARC both at the state level and through ARC power to develop a lot of the road infrastructure and the water and sewer infrastructure that will serve this project. Um, it's a project, again, that we are extremely excited about and uh, have been really fortunate to have everybody, state and federal funding agencies, uh, really being supportive of it for us. I'm also pleased to say we have, uh, have already had four active prospects that have uh, asked us questions about uh, the potential sites and when, when they will be complete. If you could go to the next slide for me. That is the high wall to kind of put in perspective, and that is really the, pro the reason we really had not been able to develop this site. As soon as we were able to secure funding to remove the high wall and acquire the uh, property itself, the 200 acres, we've really been able to move quickly over the last two years. Uh, and I really attribute that to, again, it's a regional project. And I know anyone that's done this for any amount of time has heard the word regional, regional, regional. But there, there's a big difference in saying regional and doing regional. And on this project, I can certainly say we're doing regional with uh, three counties and one city. And we actually have another county that is in a uh, planning district adjacent to us that is uh, participating in this project as well. What we did is created what the state of Virginia through code allows you to do is create a regional industrial facilities authority. And essentially what that is, it allows you to work together and uh, allows revenue sharing without the need for a referendum vote on any project that is deemed a regional industrial facilities authority project. So um, again, one of the best things about how this project's come together for us has really just been timing. Uh, sometimes timing, I guess, is good and sometimes timing is bad, but uh, for this project, every time we seem to run into some type of hurdle, we find a funding source or a opportunity to, uh, to keep moving forward. So as our management team says, if we have hurdles in front of us, which we do daily, we either jump over them or we run through them. So um, again, real quickly, I would be amiss if I didn't thank uh, DHCD in Virginia in Richmond. I can't speak for other states, the other 12 ARC states, but I can speak for Virginia. Uh, our DHCD staff does an absolutely amazing job advising us and guiding us through the, the, the gauntlet of funding and how and what funds are best for us to, to utilize on projects. Um, I believe, Peter, that's just a quick summary of kind of the project. And hopefully I stayed within the time limits. Great, thank you so much, Dwayne. And I, I have one quick question for you before we move on. So moving a high wall, you know, you are basically moving a mountain from one place to another, and that's a huge feat. But I want to understand how you got four separate counties and a city to come together to be able uh, to, to approve of this commission. So if you could go over that a little bit, that would be very helpful. Thank you. Well, and this, this may sound extremely simple, but those four counties in, uh, in one city, uh, there's personalities with each of those groups that all really like each other. I think most of us know if you have you know, if you, if you have a relationship and you can get along with people, you can get a whole lot more done than when you're not getting along with people. So, I mean, it is really a team effort. Uh, one thing we all do on Twitter with everything, all the localities when we refer to this project is hashtag stronger together. Um, that really has been how we've been able to, to get things moving. And also, I mean, there is a revenue, revenue sharing component. So, uh, mm -hmm. All of the localities know that participating in this project, even though the, it may not be in their footprint, it certainly will hopefully will certainly will create uh, employment opportunities for their citizens and also give them some money through the revenue sharing process. So we like each other and we're paying a little bit of money. Everyone gets a little <laughs> money. So um, that's a perfect formula, I think. I was going to say, that's a recipe for success. Everybody's happy and everybody gets paid. That's perfect. Thank you so much. Thank you, Peter. <laughs> Thank you so much for your presentation, Dwayne. I, I really appreciate it. So now we move on to our cutting edge project. Then I'd like to introduce Cheryl DeBerry, who has worked with the Garrett County Economic Development for 18 years and has been on the broadband team for five. 
Her background in rural business development and grant writing has helped her assist local ISPs in expanding their broadband service areas across the mountainous terrain in Garrett County, home of the highest point in Maryland. And now, with the power of the internet, I will turn it over to Cheryl. Cheryl, go ahead. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Um, as you can see on the map there, Garrett County is one of only three counties in Maryland that lie in the Appalachian region. We're very, very different than the rest of our state. You know, much like Appalachia is very different from the rest of the country. Um, we're a county government working in a county with a population of about 30,000 people and 656 square miles or almost 420,000 acres. We're home of the highest point in Maryland, of course, and 71% of our land is forested. Our commissioners made broadband expansion a top priority over a decade ago, and we've been working hard to help our businesses and residents get connected. Um, we have found some innovative ways to work with our private partners, especially in the broadband arena. We have had a private, I, I have to say up front, we've had a private partner consultant, uh, CTC Technology and Energy, they're listed up there, um, since 2009, I think maybe 2008, and they have helped us with everything, with feasibility analysis, with planning, with engineering, grant compliance, and partner management. And without them, I think we would have been lost at times, so we really appreciate their help. Um, we've gotten a lot of press on our biggest project, funded through ARC resources, um, where we partnered with a private partner to deploy a fixed wireless system using, originally we thought we would use TV white space, and, uh, but we added in some other unlicensed spectrum to try to extend broadband service to our most rural residents. But I also wanna talk about our other local ISPs and some other um, activities that we've been working on. So we'll go to the next slide. We've worked with private partners to do a variety of projects, as you can see here. Um, but back to the fixed wireless project, we were the applicant for the initial ARC funding. Um, so we were the managers of those projects and own the assets for them. We targeted six key areas in the county with that project with help from CTC. We identified those areas as the low hanging fruit. Um, our, we went to bid and found a private partner who had has found beyond our project, additional USDA and FCC funding and expanded on our initial project to over, right, right now we have over a thousand customers connected, both residents and um, businesses and even one small school uh, through the fixed wireless system. Uh, so beyond that, the state of Maryland last year released some funding that we were able to access to help three of our internet service providers expand into um, rural areas, a few small areas, just expanding their footprint a little bit as, at a time. Um, the most innovative and fun thing that I think we do is we've asked our county roads crews to help dig trenches and install conduit along county roads where we own the right of way. So if the company provides the conduit, we install two conduits, one for that company to use and one for an open source, anybody, any other internet service provider could be using it. And um, we've, we've done one project on the ground with that, but we've offered it up and we have some areas that we're looking at to, to, to do the engineering on. We help our partners navigate the local and state bureaucracy and try to make the right connections and who they need to speak with. Um, this spring, we began a crowdsourcing project with mapping. Um, some of the federal maps are not the most accurate when you get down to the address level. So we have a website set up where residents can either do a speed test and rate their current provider, or um, they can report a location without available broadband. They can also call me and I will enter that data um, for people who do not have broadband. They of course can't do that. And uh, we have, I think over 700 responses to that right now. We've been trying to do a few ways of helping other people get connected that can't be served by some of these other methods. Um, we've done cellular signal boosters. Um, we actually purchased a couple of those and are loaning those to folks to see if they will work in areas of our county where signals aren't great and trying to find them uh, an interim solution until we can get them a more stable connection. So next slide. So we are talking about public-private partnerships and of course those are, there are lots of lessons to be learned with those. Um, with our big, you know, the big 
the big takeaway is both parties have to be protected. You have to have an upfront agreement. Um, and the bottom line for your private partner is they need to make money. They're a business. They're trying to be profitable. Um, public entities need to use their money wisely. So making sure that documentation is done on everything, geolocated where the equipment and installations are, requiring backup and justification for everything, but making it easy so that the private provider isn't doing paperwork all the time. Building in flexibility. As I said, we were starting with TV white space on our first project, but quickly realized that there were other um, types of signals that we could send that had cheaper antennas and would still work uh, in some areas. And regular communication is great and always get help. Next slide, please. I just wanted to um, put our contact information and our website up there. The website has some uh, nice resources for you to uh, check out about our projects. And um, I have our additional team members there as well. So thank you very much. Great, thank you so much, Cheryl. I really appreciate your, your presentation and sharing that with us today. So knowing that you have a P3, can you explain a little bit about like what was the difference between you know, utilizing the P3 process, like what's a big takeaway that's a difference between that P3 process and like a normal procurement that you might have otherwise done? That's a good question. I mean, it, I guess in some cases, procurement of a public-private partnership is pretty much the same um, as normal procurement. Uh, I mean, as a county government, we of course have our procurement policy, and I'm going to say we use it with most of our project, broadband projects when we need them, but otherwise we give our county attorney headaches whenever we wanna do innovative new things. Um, a lot of time the procedure for getting a private partner is actually determined by the funding source. So the grantor has whatever process you need to do, use. So with ARC, we did go out to bid, we got bids, we evaluated all of those, we talked to um, you know, all, all of those companies and we found our private partner. Um, with the state funding sources that I mentioned, the, the, there really wasn't a process to find those. We sent the state's RFP out to the ISPs because the county had to be an, an applicant. They came to us with projects and we submitted the application because the county had to be the applicant. And we actually didn't create the MOU, the Memorandum of Understanding with those private companies until after we were awarded. Great. So it really came for you to make the determination. It sounds like it was really the funding source, right? So when you could it really use it, it, yeah. So when it makes sense and the funding source allows it, you used it. And when you kind of couldn't, you used the you know, traditional procurement. Exactly. Exactly. And, you know, in some cases we can piggyback off of state contracts that have already been negotiated as well for mm -hmm. things like um, maintenance and fiber installation. That's great. Well, thank you so much for your presentation. We appreciate it. Thank you. And now we're going to move on to the future project when the test the limits of our current infrastructure to improve on how we move from place to place. I want to introduce you to Patrick Smith, who is the Senior Managing Director for Stakeholder Affairs at Drive Ohio. Prior to serving in this position, he worked as Drive Ohio's Interim Executive Director and as the Administrator of the Office of Legislative Affairs at the Ohio Department of Transportation. Patrick has lived in Columbus for the last 15 years, where he has served as an aide in the Ohio Senate, represented private sector and nonprofit entities in Washington, D.C. and Columbus, Ohio, and in leadership positions in state executive agencies. And with that, Patrick, we will let you take us to the future. <laughs> well, thank you, Peter. It is great to be with you all today. Thanks for this opportunity to speak um, and share a little bit about the work we're doing at Drive Ohio um, and, and, and hopefully some context into how it fits into this broader conversation today and my excitement about what, what is to come. Um, and, and what that collaboration looks like. I, I've heard that, that phrase used quite a few times today, and, and I, I think you'll, you'll see it come through quite a bit in my presentation and in theme. So first, I want to start just with a quick primer on what Drive Ohio is. So we're, we're, we're set up to be the state center for smart mobility, um, focused on connected and automated vehicle technology on the ground and in the air, um, and, and with, with now a, a very strong look around the electrification, electric infrastructure as industry trends move in that direction. So, we are an initiative housed in the Ohio Department of Transportation. I'm so excited to be here with you all today um, from that perspective. So uh, Drive Ohio uh, has been around for just over two years now and, and really have had an exciting opportunity to advance uh, some of the efforts and, and this technology as it continues to evolve and, and, and we, we look at ways it can, it can benefit. So as you can see on this slide, um, safety, mobility, access, reliability, and talent are the core pillars uh, that drive the work we, can, we do. Uh, and at the very top of that is absolutely safety. Um, the belief is, and, and we do believe, that this technology has the capabilities over time to make our roadways safer. 
uh, and, and to utilize it as, as, as we can to do just that. And, and, there's, and there's also a, a large possibility around the mobility and access issues that it can help, help lead towards. Um, the reliability being the piece in different places around, around a reliable commute. When, when you know when you leave somewhere, how long it's gonna take you to get there. Sometimes that's congestion issues around major cities or sometimes it's just you know, other uh, traffic issues that may be out there for construction, other things that can be factored in. And then talent, uh, a key part of, of this conversation and this technology is, is a recognition around the disruption that comes with it, um, but what also a focus on that conversation and the talent in the state of Ohio and the capabilities we have. Next slide, please. So I'd like to show this slide to give you a feel for, for the work and the opportunity and the collaboration going on in the state of Ohio. It is a statewide initiative um, with, with different projects going on in all different corners of the state. I'm certainly gonna zoom in and focus on Southeast Ohio and, and some of the exciting projects um, going on uh, in Appalachia, the Appalachian part of the state. Um, but, but just kind of as you look around the state, as you can see, great partners um, at, at the Ohio Turnpike, um, you know, and then I'm going to focus a little bit later on the 33 Smart Mobility Corridor and some of the, the fiber capabilities there and the test corridor that it's going to be um, as we move forward in, in different applications. Um, but as you can see, looking at the, 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 the southeast corner of the map, uh, the big project I do want to talk to is the Deploying Automated Technology uh, Anywhere project coming out of the USDOT's Automated Driving System Grant Project. If I could go to the next slide, please. So we were very excited. Uh, USDOT put out a very innovative grant opportunity uh, last year, um, and, and we were able to put together a great coalition of partners to go after that. Um, Ohio ended up being one of eight states that were awarded one of these grants um, with an idea of, of looking at connected automated vehicle technology and the data that goes with it and how that can help uh, go back to, frankly, USDOT as they look at regulations and policies uh, for these technologies as they continue to advance. So the project that we put in, specifically in Ohio, was, was with a great set of partners. As you can see in the map, it kind of details some of the different activities and, and partners that are a part of that. But, but what I would say is, as the idea uh, the, around the conversation was, where, there, where are there market gaps with this technology right now that we could look at uh, and explore uh, in Ohio and, and potentially help advance it along so that, that everybody can benefit from this technology, but also the safety aspects that I talked about earlier can, can truly be proliferate Around, around different parts of the state. So our, our approach was recognizing there's a lot of research and activity going on uh, in major cities around different automated and connected vehicle technologies. Um, you know, the robo-taxi conversation, you, you maybe hear a little bit or read a little bit about, um, as, as well as other pieces. We wanted to focus on, on, on that, the rule setting for this technology, and specifically with, with different partners, explore what gaps exist or what challenges may exist with the technology in, in these settings uh, in this part of, of our state, but also, uh, you know, as, as the microcosm it is uh, for others. You know, I, I think there's a stat out there, something like 97% of the, the land in the country is in rural areas. So, so to truly, again, get the safety benefits out of this, we're going to need to see what this technology and how it interacts as it matures uh, in rural settings. So, so as you can see, part of this project, uh, it, it ends up being about a $7.5 million award from the U.S. Department of Transportation with about a $10 million match from all of our partners which is exciting to see that level of partnership. And truly, as I've heard described here, that public-private partnership is, is, is what has developed on it. Um, we have a, a strong focus on, on that collaboration with both industry, academia, and our local government, state government, and federal government partners. Uh, one of the, the exciting things about Drive Ohio is being housed in the Department of Transportation. We also have liaisons in 13 different state agencies and an opportunity truly to be a one-stop shop for companies looking to research, test, and deploy. Go ahead, next slide, please. Another project that we're working on, um, which we're excited about, is, is again in, this, in, in, in the Athens area. Um, it, it's a Department of Energy grant that came out. Another Department of Energy has, has got some very innovative uh, grant and mobility grant applications that they've put out there. So we were excited to partner with, and Rural Action being the lead on this, but other local, local partners um, to, to explore electrification in rural settings and also you know, autonomous uh, capabilities. Um, it, it, it is a continuation of, of this work and an opportunity to look at what what is a roadmap or a playbook potentially look like look like for communities in rural rural areas exploring this technology and the ability to to kind of continue to advance it. So we're going to have a unique opportunity um, with with some with Hapcap and other partners in that in that in that area to to both look at electric uh, 
electric shuttle capabilities, as well as then with the Transportation Research Center, what, what a, an autonomous vehicle running a specific route looks like and, and the type of data and experiences it has in those areas and what, what can be gleaned from that, again, for, for roadmap type projects. Uh, next slide, please. So I'm always excited to share this. Uh, in another part of the state, but up in, up in the Youngstown area, they were fortunate to win a USDOT build grant uh, two years back and are, are continuing to, to advance that project along. Part of the project, a, a subset of the project, is an autonomous vehicle, a shuttle uh, that would run connecting, you know, a, a healthcare, the hospital, to the university, to the downtown, um, utilizing it and that capacity. The large part of the project is a streetscape project. They're going to be doing some major work there on the Fifth Ave part of the, the map, as you can see. Uh, and what I think is really interesting is as they advance this project um, with those streetscape work, the, the shuttle won't come until a later part of next year or, or 2020, uh, 2022. Um, but what they're, what they're doing is they're factoring in this technology as they look at the, the streetscape work they're doing. And also WERDA, the, the transit uh, leader there, will be the lead entity on this, this project. So. Uh, exploring and incorporating that 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 technology into into their their to their work. Go ahead, next slide, please. And I'll I'll close on this slide. Uh, just and it's a quick uh, a glimpse into the work we're doing in a broader perspective. So, uh, 33 uh, US 33 Smart Mobility Corridor, uh, as you saw on the map a little while back, is is the corridor running just north um, northeast or north yes northwest from Columbus, Ohio. And it's specifically exciting because it is set up to be a test corridor. It, it leaves the Transportation Research Center, which I'll talk about a little bit later, uh, you know, in an opportunity, but it, which the, the TRC is the largest independent automotive proving ground in the country. Um, they also, it, with, over, with over 4,000 acres, they also have a over 500 acre smart center that has been up specifically to test automated and connected vehicle technology. So a great set of capabilities and an opportunity there. That, that, that is located right along, as you can see on the map in East Liberty, Ohio, that lead, you're able to leave the, the potential proving ground and do work on, in rural settings. It's a, two, a four, four lane divided highway coming around 33 and gets into Marysville, a, you know, a, a small community with all 27 signals connected and down into Dublin, Ohio. The exciting part of this is we laid all 35 miles with fiber and it's got connectivity or roadside units every 2000 feet. So it'll be one of the longest, if not the longest continuously connected corridor uh, potentially in the country or the world as, as it's fully operational in the coming months. We're excited for that and where the technology can help us learn from the proving and the testing grounds that work there and how we move forward. So appreciate the time and uh, I will pause there, Peter. I know I, I, we could talk all day as you, you and I know about this subject. <laughs> No, that's great, Patrick. I appreciate it. Thank you for talking to us about these, you know, exciting projects and the, and the things that are that are happening in the state. And, you know, looking at all the different projects from the ADS grant to the 33 corridor and, and um, the Youngstown project. And uh, the, the, the question that I have is, you know, how do you build these coalitions? You know, because they all, you know, none of them are just drive Ohio going it alone, right? So how are you building these coalitions uh, in these areas to be able to move forward on uh, these projects? Yeah, no, I appreciate the question. Um, it, 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 I, I mentioned you heard me say the word collaboration, and, and it's one that, that is at the very core of our work. Um, some part of Drive Ohio is something we call the Drive Ohio Alliance, and it's nothing more than what quarterly or, or even 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 uh, eventually monthly conversations we have with all the stakeholders that are interested in this space in the state of Ohio, and frankly, outside entities that are that are paying attention to monitoring this, this this technology, and an opportunity for us to have a very collaborative and sharing of best practices and, and learning. Uh, together and and part of that drives how 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 we come up with this um, at a core of, of of a couple of those projects I laid out there is the transportation research center I, you know I described the capabilities um, and 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 then the, what that group brings to the asset and what it is in the state of Ohio that on top of some very very strong state universities the Ohio State University University of Cincinnati and Ohio University specifically on some of these projects we've talked about today. Uh, can't say enough for for the partnership that they bring to it, and frankly, the expertise and, and vision and, and views they bring to it that help us have a well-rounded, well-crafted uh, strategic uh, project that that frankly can be productive as, as we continue to play it out. Well, that's great. Thank you so much uh, for sharing with us all the things that you guys are doing. So, um, for our audience, really quickly, now is a great time to submit questions for the panel through the Q and A box. I'll just kick us off after our video here in a moment. Um, but please get those questions in so uh, we can ask the panelists what's on your mind. Um, and right now we have a brief video from Ohio Grid to share with everyone before we move to questions.
of the major inhibitors of economic progress and development in this region is the lack of connectivity. GRIT is focused on addressing that problem and working to reduce the impact of that barrier. The Smart Bus Initiative is helping our rural communities take a step in the right direction by providing them with locations where they can access the internet. By providing connectivity in these areas, school-aged children can access online curriculum and communicate with their teachers, and adults can utilize the tools we provide to identify and develop their skill set and eventually seek employment. Unfortunately, we live in an area that still has an equitable internet connectivity. Uh, roughly 30% of our student population either doesn't have the ability to purchase reliable high-speed internet access due to no service providers in their area or simply they just can't afford it. But providing high-speed internet access to all of our students would close that gap and solve a lot of issues when we're in these situations. In rural America, one of the biggest opportunities that we have is being able to get solid internet connections. What we're attempting to provide through our Ohio Means Job Centers is mobile internet, utilizing our vans. Um, we're also looking at smart buses and having those available in the community. One of the benefits of having the mobile Wi-Fi is to where we can get job certificates on the work site when we're not able to make it into our work location. So it makes it pretty handy and very accessible here at the work location. That was great. It was great to hear about the good work being done by Ohio Grit and how they're trying to make sure that everyone in uh, rural areas and Appalachia have an opportunity to get to broadband. So before we get into some of the, the uh, uh, audience questions, I have a couple of questions myself. So the first, and I feel like this is the one that everyone is getting asked right now, it's the COVID question, right? So what are some of the ways that you have had to adapt your projects or even your approach in response to COVID? So have there been any particular challenges or even opportunities that came from the pandemic that you weren't expecting? I guess I could tackle that one. Great. <laughs> <laughs> so um, broadband during COVID, so COVID definitely increased the urgency of the need for families with kids who needed to get online to um, suddenly work from home. Um, we had a lot of teleworkers suddenly, um, including myself, that had to you know, move a computer home and work. Um, so it, it increased our volume of calls from people who are absolutely desperate for internet connectivity. And um, it increased our, you know, our state um, that's when they started rolling out more of these grant programs to try to help us meet these needs is, you know, they have, they have provided extra funding um, available for us to do some more work in that arena. So yeah, it's definitely increased our urgency and our efforts. For that too, has it also increased, you know, um, more of an understanding either in your legislature or in your locals about how important it is? You know, do you see a shift in, people's attitudes towards the necessity of broadband before COVID versus after COVID, or do you think it's kind of stayed the same? Yeah, that's an interesting question. I mean, I think from our federal delegation and their representatives in our region have definitely been way more responsive to our questions and our requests for um, um, help. So yeah, it's definitely helped with that. Um, and our commissioners, you know, they take a lot of calls as well from folks who, um, reiterate the, the need and um, you know our healthcare system has also been pretty um, pr pretty uh, pretty uh, they've they've asked a lot of um, uh, for, for a lot of help um, for their workers to work from home to do some telemed stuff to be able to access their files from home and so yeah it's been an interesting ride. <laughs> Peter, Peter, this is Dwayne. I, just, just to add real quick, and I know ours is more like we've talked about a classic infrastructure project, but you mentioned the fact that we're moving a high wall, as you phrased it, you know, moving a mountain. Mm -hmm. The one thing that's been really good about that is that mountain or high wall, as you saw on the slide, is adjacent to a huge amount of traffic every day. And I think every one of us, I know myself, you know, we, we've been beat down a little bit by all this COVID stuff. And I wouldn't say we're depressed, but everybody's probably a little bit down. I mean, just because of the change in, in, in our lives right now. 
but have had quite a few people mention to us they're still seeing construction occurring with this site. They're seeing this mountain being moved. And uh, though it may just be a morale thing, it, it's really helpful to the people in our region to see, hey, you know, not everything is at a standstill and things are going to continue to move forward. And one day, uh, you know, hopefully we're through this and we've got a new industrial park and hopefully have some, some good economic development. So. Yeah, and Peter, I mean, for, from my perspective and the work, work we're into, it, it's been interesting through through this these last few months as, as people start to look at technology and the capabilities for contactless delivery and different things like that. It, it starts to zoom in even a desire more to, to learn the things we need to learn through the ADS grant, for example, um, for, for some of the passenger and, and potential goods delivery that these vehicles could provide in the future. So all those challenges that we need to we need to learn and step through from, from connectivity issues to, to different infrastructure and things that, that may factor into uh, you know, the technology being able to truly operate the way we, we hope it can. Um, it, it, it is kind of maybe zoomed in and focused in on, on the possibilities there um, for, for both healthcare and as well as uh, food delivery and things like that, as you've seen both in the you know, you know, pilots and projects going on with drone delivery of, of different uh, goods and services. And, and also you know, some of the projects going on around the country around goods delivery utilizing both shuttles and vehicles and otherwise has, has been one of the kind of the turns and focus of that industry uh, and the capabilities it can provide through all of this into the future. Sure. And I think, you know, in my role here in Broadband, Ohio, I think that's what we're seeing as well. So, you know, people are prior to that, prior to COVID, you know, everyone talked about how important internet was, but I think that, that, you know, state homeowners and things like that have really driven home um, how important broadband is and and some of the folks who may have been a little bit late to the game uh, of being interested in 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 uh, broadband expansion have really started to turn around and be like how can it do even more you know in these kinds of projects that you're talking about patrick and or, or how do we get them either associated with some of the classic projects to win that you're working on or how do we get them you know how do we how do we you know really integrate um, and have a program um kind of how cheryl is doing it in 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 her view so that that has been that's what we've been seeing as a change as well and 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 and, and that kind of leads into my next question which is you know you know infrastructure talking about infrastructure you know 10 15 years ago you know, people really kind of had an understanding of what that meant but but how are some of the biggest ways that infrastructure projects have changed over the past 10 years and how are we seeing like technology get integrated into those kinds of infrastructure projects and that'll be for everybody well this is Dwayne. i'll jump in first first they're a lot more expensive than they used to be but uh uh, but I know we've really, I mean, and when we focus, whether it's on a broadband project in our region or a water project, the one thing that, that I've noticed, there's really a lot of similarity when it comes to putting, whether it's a broad fiber in the ground or water line in the ground. And so we've really been, been able to, I think, utilize some of the techniques and experience we have with traditional infrastructure to help us kind of overcome obstacles and also find ways to to save money using newer infrastructure and installing some of this fiber. That's great. Cheryl or Patrick? <laughs> yeah, Peter, I mean, it's interesting to see, you know, this, this, this the kind of world I live in is the smart tech and, and how it can, can help, um, you know, with, with, with information and data uh, perspectives. And then one of the things we're exploring is, is vehicles and how you can get information to people that are driving and vehicles now and then make things safer, right? Well, you know, certainly a big part of the projects and, and efforts over time have been different engineering and, and physical infrastructure build outs. But now the opportunity is with some of this data to provide that, those insights into people. Um, and not not in that part of the, the Southeast part of the state, but an exciting project that happened up in the Columbus area was something called the Smart Lane. And it was utilizing technology to open and close a hard shoulder um, on, 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 a, on a stretch of highway coming out of downtown Columbus. Um, and, and, and frankly, you know, the variable speed limits um, to, to kind of, you know, help with traffic flow in and out. So it's just an example of utilizing technology uh, in and around infrastructure and, and different insights we can glean from that. Another example that, that comes to mind is, is what we're exploring up in I-90, up in the northeastern part of the state, uh, along where there's a lake effect corridor, um, where, where, as you guys know, uh, in that part of the state, the, the snow can come in like, like crazy and, and created these whiteout conditions, but been able to utilize variable speed limits to, to raise them or to lower the speed limit when, when certain weather uh, pieces are starting to come in and, and, and show what that looks like. The next level of that is connected vehicle and, and vehicle information that you could provide um, and ways to kind of make roadways safer, but also 
uh, and frankly, in that part of the state as well, you know, that stretch of highway, there's not a ton of connectivity. So exploring different technology capabilities to help to be able to get that type of information out. Great. So would you say, if you think that there's now more of an expectation that, you know, and, and coming from a little bit of the transportation wing myself, you know, it used to be, you know, that they built roads and, and there might be this idea that you could put something next to it, um, you know, for, for broadband or other connectivity purposes. And if you were doing a water project, it may just be a water project. If you're doing electricity, it may just be electricity. But are we seeing more of this expectation that you build in some sort of connectivity into these projects as they go forward? Dwayne or Cheryl, I don't know if you have any thoughts. One, one thing that's been interesting is certainly to see as we continue to look at some of the very innovative grants and opportunities, even traditional grants coming out of USDOT, is, is how do you start to factor some of these things into uh, approaches and in, 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 in that as you, as you look forward to going back to federal government from some of those projects and local, local partners. It's really been exciting in the Lordstown area and Youngstown area and other parts that I've mentioned where they have explored um, different collaborations, what that looks like, and how to factor some of those things into. I, you heard me talk about it, what, is, what is largely a traditional streetscape work going on in Youngstown and how you can factor in potentially some of the technologies into those projects. It's been interesting for me to see as I've worked around the state with different partners, including some of like this. That's great. Well, I'm going to move on now to some um, audience Q&A, and I'm going to start off with kind of a general one for everybody, which is, Many of you have done projects where you need to find a local match. So where are you getting your matching funds? Like what are some of the places that you've been able to go to get the matching funds for these projects? I can tackle that. Um, sometimes it's county commitment and general funds um, for us. Sometimes we work with other partners. Uh, our private partners always have skin in the game. And um, more recently, we have applied for some federal funding that we're also applying as a co-applicant with the state and they're kicking in some money. So it's always a combination of beg, borrowing and stealing. You know, we're Appalachian people, we're scrappy, we try to figure things out. So we, we find it where we can and we try to, um, you know, try to find funding sources that may not be traditionally for, you know, things like broadband, you know, infrastructure, um, may not be, con you know, broadband may not be considered infrastructure in the old way people thought, but now it's starting to be. So we're finding some, some unique new ways to do that. Yeah, Peter, this is, this is Dwayne and kind of like Cheryl alluded to, we've been real fortunate, you know, as I mentioned earlier, DHCD, our state administrating agent has been really good to work with us to be able to plug in and utilize the matching of state funds with federal funds. And you know, every state has their own different pots of money, but in Virginia, for instance, we have the Virginia Tobacco Commission and a few other funding sources. So we're, as Cheryl said, we're really resourceful in uh, uh, flipping over rocks and looking for money, or I know anyone that's done this for any amount of time ha has had the argument with somebody over whether money is federal or state money. And I always go with the approach, it should be whatever it is that you need it to be to make the match work. So, uh, uh, but yeah, it's, it, it's, it's certainly a, a, a interesting thing to try to piece these projects together. Sure. Yeah, that is definitely true. Just trying to, you know, kind of wherever you can find it. <laughs> so, and that, that actually leads me into um, a question. This one's actually more targeted for you, Cheryl. Um, some people have been asking uh, a question about um, how you have a technical consultant advising you and working for you as you roll out broadband in the county. So did you have a specific funding source for that contract? Um, um, or, or where did you find the funds to be able to hire that consultant? Yeah, definitely. So we started out with a feasibility study back whenever the commissioners created broadband as a major um, goal for their county. Um, we did a feasibility analysis and we asked them to come up with a plan of course, we did our RFP, we got our, you know, through our procurement process. So um, that original funding was just for them to tell us what to do. And then when we got um, our first implementation grant through ARC, 
then we built in some money for administration for that so that we could keep them on board because we did not have the engineering expertise or the project expertise for this kind of thing. It was new back then. Um, it's still kind of new for a lot of places. So um, we have either built into other ensuing grant applications some money for that, or we have also kicked in general funds for that because it is so important for us to have them on our team. And has that contract, you know, you said that you didn't necessarily have the engineering expertise to be able to put this. So, so you would say that contract made a big difference for being able to get these projects off the ground and having a future plan for how to kind of move forward with broadband in the area. Oh yeah, oh yeah, and it's and it's evolving. I mean, we originally were going with TV white space, and you know that works great for going across long distances and over hills and through some trees. But once it's in a little community, sometimes we can use the cheaper antennas to using other unlicensed spectrum to shoot between houses and between you know the the initial point in that community. So, you know, we're finding ways to save money in uh, in in those kind of um, situations as well. Sure, that's great. So speaking of saving money and, and it's kind of keeping on that theme right now. So what are, and, and this might be directed a little bit more at Dwayne, but what are some of the best practices for determining prevailing wage on projects since DOL doesn't regularly have broadband construction activities listed? And what are some ways you can navigate the standard industry practice that engineering and construction companies are usually one and the same for broadband projects? So that's probably both for you and Cheryl. Uh, Dwayne, you and Cheryl both um, might be able to, um, to help answer that. I know what we've had to do because we've done done our fair share of broadband projects and have a lot going on in our footprint right now. And that really has been an issue when you get prevailing wage rates and you request them, you know, you, you see labor, bulldozer driver, you don't really see line splicer and a lot of the other, you know, classifications. So what we've really had to do a lot of times is rely just on interpretation, calling people uh, and just trying to, you know, reach out to our funding agencies. And again, you know, no matter who the agency is that they're wonderful to work with and just, just communicate and even had to have sometimes them reach out to the Department of Labor and as Cheryl and I'm sure you know Patrick know once you get a determination you're fairly confident you can continue to use that same determination on other projects from that that point forward. Yeah where we have to do that yeah I second that Dwayne. Um, where we have to use prevailing wage. Um, I mean, a lot of times those contracts have already been negotiated with the state so we can use those numbers, um, which is handy. Um, but honestly, um, if we don't have to use those on projects like the state's funding um, through their funding sources, um, our local guys can install fiber a lot cheaper than those rates. And we try to use that as much as we can, of course. Sure. Well, that's great. No, I, I appreciate that. So I'm actually going to move over to Patrick here for a second and just ask a little bit about, you mentioned the build grant. Can you expand a, a little bit on the project, the Smart 2 project uh, with Youngstown um, and kind of what the funding was for and where they got their match from? Yeah, no, I appreciate the opportunity to. Um, it, was, uh, it was, as I mentioned, awarded, I think last year or early part of the year before. Um, and and it, it ended up being about a $20 million project, 10 million that, that they won from the feds, but 10 million that they put together from local partners. And it, it both Youngstown State University, the Council of Governments, the city and others all, all came together to be able to put together that match. And I think it was a, it was a powerful part of, of why they were successful, frankly, um, as, as they put that together. And, and what else it drives is there's a lot of skin in the game and that collaboration uh, that, that is so important to these, what, what I refer to as these smart mobility projects and, and things that we get into, having, having that true, uh, you know, the partners at the table all, all kind of rowing in the same direction. Um, so what's, the cool, what's cool about that, you, you heard me describe, and, 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 you know, the shuttle being only a subset of that broader project, but it's an exciting initiative within that community, um, looking at technology and the capabilities that come along with it. And it's driven conversations, broader conversations around just smart smart intersections, smart, uh, you know, other pieces, uh, you know, uh, connectivity pieces that come along and then more fiber could factor into some of that along along the routes and otherwise. So uh, I think it, it's both a, a driver and others. We're also exploring, uh, looking forward next year, uh, you know, when, as, soon as, as soon as possible into the second half of the year, um, Ohio Smart Mobility Summit in that part of the, the state um, to be able to showcase some of the activities going on uh, up there. So looking forward to that. Um, and, and what, you know, they're, they're, they're the next stages that come in the procurement that they'll have to do along um, with, with uh, technology partners, shuttle providers, uh, is a key thing along a great collaboration with, with Ward of the transit agency there. Sure, no, that is exciting, you know, knowing that there's another shuttle. Obviously, there's still one in Columbus. There was 
there, that's the, which is the second one in the state, and knowing that there's going to be one in Youngstown. Um, to build off of that, this will be for you and actually for everybody. Um, knowing that, you know, when we're talking about broadband projects and we're talking about rights of way and we're talking about, you know, pole attachments um, or talking about putting an autonomous shuttle on the streets, like, how have you worked with meeting municipal regulations um, or the permitting process to get these things on the ground? Did you have to ask for waivers? Did you, um, or were there already regulations in place in your states to, to help you kind of navigate that process? Uh, this is Dwayne. I know, and I guess putting my broadband hat on, going from classical to, to modern now, um, we really have noticed and we, you know, we have a $20 million broadband network we built in Southwest Virginia about eight or nine years ago before broadband was cool. And one of the things that we really learned from the get go is communication, whether it's with, you know, our power companies who we often have to ask pole attachments for. Uh, I learned a long time ago, if they're at the table when we're planning the projects, it certainly flows a lot smoother than when the the lines are ready to go up and you're calling them and saying, hey, we've got a construction crew and we need these pole attachments. And I'm sure Cheryl and Patrick would echo the same sentiment. It, it's, a, it, it's been a learning process and also a relationship building process. And once you have those relationships with the players that make those decisions, uh, and hopefully they're good relationships, I can't imagine if they were bad, um, it really streamlines the process, but really communication and just learning. Yep, I echo that. Um, with some of our projects, because the county is the owner of the project and manager of it, then um, we were able to negotiate with the state some very reasonable rates to get onto like state communication towers as well, which has been very helpful for our cause. I mean, if it was profitable for private companies to come into these very rural areas and provide per service, they would have done it. So they need help and doing commercial rates on those towers and um, poles is just not feasible. Sure. Let me and let me ask a quick follow up question to that. So, you know, talking about this, who is the owner of the ISP leasing space? Is it the county or is it the the private company that puts on that, or is it or is there kind of a mix depending on where it is? So, it so the funding source depends on you know who owns the the assets, but we try very hard as a county government to stay out of all pole attachment agreements and that kind of stuff. So we have our network operator who negotiates all of those things. Um, we step in whenever we can um, with like state entities and other public entities to try to, to help the project move along. Does that answer your question? I think so, that's great. <laughs> Thank you. And I know we're, we're coming close to time, so I wanna, I wanna get us to our lightning round. So I'm gonna ask everybody the same question in the lightning round um, and uh, uh, try to keep your answer to either one word or one sentence if you can. So do the best you can. So the question is, if there was one takeaway that you wanted the audience to have from your presentation and from the question and answer session, what would it be? So Cheryl, you're on my screen, so we're gonna start with you. Just keep swimming, keep trying. <laughs> That's great. All right, Patrick, we'll go to you. Collaboration, I, I have to lean on that. It's so important uh, to, to the success of these projects, all the ones we've described. That's great, that's great. And then Dwayne, we'll, we'll, we'll end with you. Well, first, Peter, you need, to, you need to have some cards in your hand when you say lightning round. To, yeah, to, I should, yeah. <laughs> I, I'm looking to see if I can have anything. No, I don't have anything in the hand here. The lightning round. No, I would, I, I would echo what both Patrick and Cheryl said. And again, going back to, to my presentation, when you have hurdles in front of you, either figure out how to get around them, to jump over them, or as a final, final extreme, go through them. Uh, but you just have to, to keep going. That's great. Well, hey, thank you all so much for this. I appreciate it. I'm actually going to turn it back over to Director Carey.